All right, so today we're going to talk about goals. So but I titled this talk Goals 101 because it's really the basic, the most basic about goals when you start thinking about goals. So before we begin, let's go who the hell I am. Oh, I'm Miguel, Miguel Gomez. I was born in Mexico. I've been a CFP since 2014. I became an enrolled agent earlier this year. And just actually a couple of days ago, <laughs> Investment News let me know that I was honored by them in their ninth annual 40 under 40, the class of 2022. Uh, I'm actually visiting New York tomorrow to go pick up my award <laughs> to ceremony tomorrow. It's going to be fun. Uh, I've been a podcaster since 2014. My podcast is called Dinero en Español. And yes, it's all in Spanish. I have some very cool guests also. Got married in 2006. I have two children. I have seven pets, three Scottish Terriers, two rabbits, and two guinea pigs. So that's a little bit about. It. So what are we going to talk about today? So really, just a few things. We're going to make it as easy as possible. And we want to, my goal with this is that you leave the session thinking about new ways in how you think about goals. So how people generally see financial goals, another view on how to think about them, what's the role of your values in all of these. I'm gonna give you some examples and then we're gonna close with Q&A. Okay, so how do people usually see financial goals? They see them as a destination. They see them as a huge number, $5 million. I wanna be, I wanna have $5 million. I'm gonna to get to the top, I'm gonna to go to the, goal uh, to get to the destination. I'm going to get there uh, and I don't know what's going to happen afterwards, but I see that big number in my head. There was an, uh, a campaign a few years ago by one insurance company saying, what's your number? So where people they were thinking, they were making people think about what's the retirement number so that they should strive to get to that number uh, eventually. Now the problem, what's the problem with this view? Well, I see three major problems. Number one, goals seem unreachable. So when you're just thinking, well, how, how am I gonna save $3 million? How am I gonna get to whatever number? It seems incredibly high, it's impossible. I will never be able to do it. So what happens? People don't actually work for them. People don't do anything to get to them. Well, it's so difficult. Why should I bother? I don't wanna do that. Kind of like running for a marathon. I do think of a marathon. I never ran one. I just uh, enrolled. I just put my name to run a half a marathon in, in February. I have no idea how I'm going to do that because I've never done that. But we'll see how that goes. Uh, but today that seems unreachable, especially because I've never ran that distance. Um, so for some people, that's a turnoff. Well, then people that really, really, then we go to the other extreme. People miss out on life they get so focused on their goal, they get so focused on their number that nothing else matters. Uh, and this is kind of like when the fire movement, uh, one of the cons that I have against, one of the things that I have against the, the fire movement is that people get so focused on the number, people get so focused on financial independence, on retirement, retiring early, that they stop living. They eat canned tuna. Well, they're making hundreds of thousands every year and they eat canned tuna and they miss out on life. Uh, to do what? To get to that big number and then not knowing what to do. This kind of the third problem that I see is, okay, so you work so hard to get to your number, you got to your number, now what? You got to your goal, now what? What's next? You planned, you worked so hard for so many years to get to your goal, but you never really thought about what you were gonna do afterwards. And I've seen that problem with people that, uh, older people, uh, retirees, for example, that I, that, I, that I know, that I work with, people that they know very good, they know very well how to save. They save their entire lives. They build, they have incredible networks, but now they don't know what to do with that money. They're scared about spending that money. They're worried about overspending. They're, they don't know what to do. So let's just give it another shot. Just give it another view of what financial goals 
should be, how you should treat them, how you should uh, strive to achieve them. And the first, instead of seeing goals as the destination, as the place to get there, what if you see the goals as a journey? So going back to my, to my half a marathon race that I hope to finish in February, well, the goal is not getting to the finish line, the finish lane on the marathon or the race. The goal is the training, the preparation, the every day that I need to do. I need to do something to be able to run that. So it's really the, the, the journey, the process, the, the, all the days, all the training, all the eating well, all the sleeping well, everything that needs to be done to be able to get there. But, okay, so what does this mean? Well, let's, let's break it out in, a little, in, in some parts. So first of all, your goals should be a source of energy, not a drain. In other words, you sh when you have something you're striving to achieve that's where your energy should come from but when your goal is draining you when you feel bad about your goal when when your your goal is so stressful well maybe it's time to rethink your goals maybe it's time to think differently about your goals another thing very very critical goals are not set in stone your goals should be flexible in how you achieve them. So this is uh, something that I've told many people over the years as well. Uh, people may say, well, I want to get to 3 million bucks. Okay, fantastic. And then when, when we start talking with them, when we start talking to them and asking more questions to them, it's really, they don't really want the money. What they want is the lifestyle that they believe that they will be able to, that they would be able to afford with that money. So yeah, the money is important. Getting to that number may be important, but in reality, maybe what they, they are striving for is not the 3 million bucks, it's the ability to spend more time with their family, for example, or the ability to not worry about the next thing. So it's instead of fixating about the number, you should be more flexible about how you execute that goal, how you uh, leave that goal, which leads to the most important thing, your goal should be a reflection of your values. First of all, they should, on, should not be a reflection of someone else's values. And second of all, they shouldn't be just a random number that you picked out of who knows where. So this is, this is probably the most important slide of, the, of, the pres of today's presentation. Your goals should reflect your values, not someone else's. So, the, the, so this is called value-based goal setting. So the first question that comes to mind, well, first of all, what are values? If you're telling me that I should set my goals based on my values, what are values? Well, values are, you can say universal, you can say they're, they're, they've been known for millennia, but really at the end of the day, your values are your principles. Your principles are, and your values are the definition of what is important for you, to you. And this is also critical. Uh, do you, I, have, I have asked this question to many people, what's important to you? And it's funny because many, many times what I get is a blind shit, uh, 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 like, you, like a deer getting the lights in the, in the road. When you ask someone what's important to you and they don't, most of the time people don't know. Uh, and it's hard because you're going through the motions, you're living, you're going to work, or you're working from home or whatever, you're doing what you're supposed to do. But do you really know what's important to you? Have you ever asked yourself what's important to you? Well, and then the, the next question is, well, how do I know what's important to me? All right? Well, I cannot tell you, a YouTuber cannot tell you, uh, a podcast cannot tell you what's important to you. Only you can know what's important to you. So how do you define, how you find your values? Well, a lot of it is self-reflection. It's really thinking about it. It's about seeing what, what it is that you want in the world. What do you want to give to the world? What do you want from the world? So let's, and of course, at the end of the presentation, I'll give you some resources to, to guide you in your journey, to find your values. The, the, today's purpose is not to uh, 
give you your values. No, you need to define them. And for that, you need time. You probably need many hours. You probably need self-reflection. You need time alone. If you have, if you have, if you have a, a partner or a spouse, you need to speak with them as well um, to see what your family values are. But you need to start with yourself. But what we can do today is we can have a few questions to start your journey. So question number one, and I'm gonna pause for a minute to, for you to think about. Again, this is not to define your values by the end of the session, but to start to have some, some ideas, some discussion with yourself. Question number one, how does your dream life look like? If you were able to have or to leave all your dreams, how would that look like? The reason I picked the picture here is when we were children, we all had a dream. My, my first dream was to be a marine biologist, to learn about the species that live in the sea and uh, go out and live in a boat and, and explore the ocean and whatever. And of course, that did not, that did not happen. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking with you today. So what's your dream like? How does that look like? Have you ever thought about your dreams? What do you dream? What do you want to achieve? If you had everything you wanted, how would that be? What would that be? It's really, I'm not talking about having $10 million in the bank, no. I'm talking about your life, not about your possessions. I'm talking about your life. How does your dream life look like? I'm gonna pause for a moment there. Okay, next question. What do you want out of life? What do you want out of life? Now, let me tell you a story of why I picked, why I picked this picture right here. You see the little dog treats there. I met a, a, a lady, a young professional. She worked at a tech company. And if if she were in, if she wasn't in her twenties, if she was in in her sixties, she would be the the crazy dog woman. <laughs> you know that stereotype of this lady with uh, of this person with many cats or many dogs. Well, in her case, dogs were her life. Everything she did was so that she was able to feed more dogs, to rescue more dogs, to give money to charities that support dogs to uh, pay uh, bad bills of sick dogs or whatever. Uh, dogs were her life. And her mom would tell her many times, hey, stop spending so much money on dogs. Stop doing that. You're crazy. But at the end of the day, that was her life. That was what was important for her. She couldn't see life. If she saw a dog suffering, she could not just let it go. She would need to take care of that dog. She would need to have the money to pay to, for that dog to be taken care of. It didn't matter to her if she lived miserably, miserably, because she was happy with her life. So in, in, for her to take care of stray dogs, to take care of sick dogs was a very high priority, was high in her value list. So what does it, what does it mean for her? Well, it meant that she needed to work very strict hours. She couldn't stay longer than needed. She couldn't stay longer than, than, than you know, five o'clock in the afternoon or six o'clock or whatever, because she needed to go home to take care of the dogs. That meant that her social life was probably somewhat diminished in the standard way that you see a social life for a 20 something person, but she had friends. She knew other people that care about dogs. So her social circle was very different to what she saw at her company. And she was very happy. She was very content it, with her good salary, with her whatever. She was getting the, the life. She was living the life that she wanted. And she was content and she was okay with it. 
This doesn't mean that she was not saving. This does not mean that she was not preparing for other things, but it just means that dogs were very high on her list. So I'm gonna ask you again, what do you want out of life? How do you wanna feel when you go to bed? What, what kind of difference do you feel that you're making? Or what, what do you want life to give you? So this is today. What do you want out of, out of life today? But then again, the next question is, what do you want now? What do you want in 10 years, in 20 years? What do you want beyond 20 years? And for some people, this, this is an unfathomable. This is something they cannot think about. For some people, this is something that one of my mentors told me when, when, I, when I first um, work, started working with him told me, and then I'll never forget this, people that are in survival, in survival mode, uh, if you're first gen, it was probably your parents or your, or your grandparents, people that are in survival mode, they can only think about the next meal, where the next meal is going to come from, what are, what are we going to eat today, where are we going to eat tomorrow, that's, your, that's your, the only worry that you have, your next meal. When you're a little bit better than that, your next worry is, what are we going to do in the weekend? Where am I going to take my children in the weekend? Where are we going to go? What am I going to do in the weekend? You're a little bit better. Where am I going to go on vacation next summer? Right? You're already thinking, it's summer now, but you're already thinking about next summer. You're planning for a year ahead. You get a little bit better, and then you start thinking, well, what am I going to how I'm going to save for retirement. How are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? And then your goals get longer and longer because probably because everything short period is already taken care of. You don't have to worry about any of that until you get to a point where your worries are, what are my, what are my, grandchild, what are my grandchildren going to do with their money they're going to inherit from me? How do I make sure that they do the right things with that money? Then all of a sudden you're thinking 50 years down the line. You don't even have children. You're already thinking about your grandchildren. <laughs> so uh, this is very interesting. It doesn't mean that you have to know everything right now. Obviously you don't. You focus on what you can focus today. If you're in survival now, if you're in sur survival mode now, focus about what can you do to get out of survival mode. If you're already making good money, if you're already putting money in your 401k or whatever, well, you can still take steps towards the future, even if the goals look uncertain today, even if you don't know how you're going to retire, even if you don't know what's going to come next, even if you don't know where you're going to be working 10 years from now, you can still do things today for that future self. And your future self will only thank you because you're preparing for your future self. So, if, how does this look like? Well, you can set multiple goals. You can short term, and I call these buckets. You can you can set multiple buckets, yeah, short term, medium term, long term. Even if you have question marks about what the long term goals will be, you probably don't know what your retirement is going to be like. You're probably not even thinking about retirement right now. Well, that does not mean that you should, you should not save for it. Why? Because money will give you choices. Money will give you options in the future. But if you don't have it, if you don't prepare for it, you won't have those choices. You won't have those options. Um, so, again, even if you don't know what that would look like. Example of short-term goal. I hate this word, emergency fund. Uh, but you, you can set aside money in case something happens. Uh, how much? How do you set aside for it? It's up to you. You decide how much, uh, but some people say three months of living expenses, six months of living expenses, one year of living expenses, 18 months of living expenses, whatever it is, that can be a very good short-term goal. That, that, that's uh, like a check mark of doing things right for your personal finance. Having, do you have an emergency fund? 
That's the first thing I ask people when they're asking me about investing. And you'll be surprised. Many people don't, don't, don't. So I tell them, well, don't invest until you have an emergency fund. The purpose of the emergency fund is not to generate return. The purpose of, is that it's money, that it's there in case you need it. It's not returns. You should not care about returns about your, when, when talking about emergency funds. So again, we're talking about short-term, medium-term, long-term goals. If you're thinking about retiring, about retirement, about if you're thinking about the next step after you, you transition from work or whatever, well, you break your big goals in micro goals. For example, you don't know what retirement will look like, but that does not mean that you cannot set aside X amount of your salary every year. Or that does not mean you cannot, you don't strive to have a balance, whatever balance in your savings account. Or for example, you're still in debt. Well, you can set aside of, of the side to have no high interest debt by whatever year, right? So these are practical steps practical goals that you can decide that you can set so that you can start working towards the life that you want. Now, the next step really is probably another way. It's, it is another way of looking at goals, which is Simon Sinek's golden circle. If you've seen his talk, start with why. If you read his book, start with why, this, you'll understand this very well. If you have not, I highly recommend you this, that you do it, that you at least watch the TED Talk. If not, if you already watch it, buy the book. So why? Well, the why is your values. You always need to start with your values. Everything that you do, when you're talking about what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, it should start with your values. Then is your goals. Again, your values are driving your goals. And finally, the what, the vehicles you'll use. Here's what many, many people get backwards. They start thinking about Bitcoin. They start thinking about uh, DeFi. They start talking about all those, whatever investments or gold or, or, or QQQ or whatever investment, because it's giving them the best, the, the, it's, it's giving them good returns. And they think about all of that before thinking about their values before thinking about their goals. You should do it the other way around. You should start with your values. If not what happens, well, what we saw last year, what I've, what I've seen with the, this year, last year we had a lot of crypto millionaires. They're saying, hold, 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 hodl, or whatever you want to say, hold, I will never sell. Well, someone that says you'll never sell is because you don't have a goal. You don't have clarity about what you want. You just want to go to the moon for what, right? What, if you have clarity about what you want to achieve, you sell when Bitcoin is at 60,000, you don't care what happens next because you're already there. You already get, got to your destination. You already satisfied your need of 1 million, 10 million, 10,000, 20,000, whatever it is. You don't need to continue to play the game if you already want. But if you don't know what you want, if you don't know your values, if you don't know your goals, it will be very easy for you to continue to play because you don't have clarity. Your only goal is a bigger number. And we all know what happened with Bitcoin this year. We all know what happened with all the other cryptocurrencies this year. It's millionaires, well, former millionaires that now they are, some of them are severely depressed. Many are thinking unthinkable thoughts. Some are just resigned. Oh, okay. All right. I lost money. Okay. Oh, well. Well, no. Yeah, you lost money, but what are you going to do about it? Are you going to plan now? Are you going to have a clear path of what you're going to do with your money going forward? Or do you just continue to huddle and see whatever happens? No, your life, your values should determine what happens next, not the price of some random security. So let's talk about some examples. Let's go with some examples. So let's say, for example, one of your values, family unity. Okay, to be with your family, if you have children or you wanna be with your parents or whatever. So how? Well, let's say, for example, that you're 
you're you're gonna leave that value family unity through your summer vacation why are you gonna how are you gonna do that what are you gonna do or are you gonna set aside x hundred amount of dollars per month in a savings account or whatever bank so see how you started with the why you start with the values you start with the value of family unity how are you going to leave that value and what are you going to do to leave that value okay for me for example my parents my parents live in mexico and i was reading something the other day my parents are in their 60s now that means that their life expectancy is around 80 although with all these things going on they may go sooner if i only see them once a year I see them three days a year in person. That means I'm only gonna see them probably 30 years, 30 days for the next 10 years. Is that enough? Is that enough to see my parents for three days a year for the next 10 years? If I love my dad, my parents, probably is not enough. If I don't care about my parents, it's probably more than I want to. So but it really depends on what your relationship with them. And then your goals start, you can start to set goals. So say, well, maybe I should not strive for three days a year. Maybe I should strive for 10 days, 15 days. And then what does that cost? What does that mean for your finances? Do they have to pay the trip? Do you have to pay the trip? Are you gonna support them for the rest of their lives? Are you, are you, there, are you your parents' pension? I know that I am because my parents are in Mexico. They, they didn't save, they didn't do anything for, for their future they bet on me and they bet on my brother so uh, now i'm gonna have to pay that i'm very thankful for whatever they did all everything they did they did for me and for my brother so i only see the fair that i need to contribute to their future so how do you plan for that another value security security is very important for me at least how do i leave that value well i save for my future self how do I save for my future self? Well, by living below my means, by maxing out, maxing out the 401k, for example, by investing aggressively. Maxing out, maxing out your 401k does not mean just put whatever much you get. No, it really means maxing it out if you're able to. You can put 19,500 per year. If you're under 50, if you're under 50, if you're over 50, you can put 7,000 more. Uh, and invest aggressively. Why? Because I value security, because I see, because having more money allows me, talking about me, Miguel, to have more security. I don't know, you may be different. I'm just talking about myself here. Uh, example number three, value, knowledge. Knowledge is very, very important to me. How do I leave that value? Well, I always look for opportunities to learn. How do, what does this mean? Well, 10% of my income is going to be used to buy books, courses, trainings, whatever, without guilt. This is very important. When you leave your values, there's no guilt. Why, why, would there be, why should there be any guilt if you're living in accordance to your values? It shouldn't. If you buy something and make, and that makes you feel bad, that, makes you, that means that you're not living in accordance to your values. If you go out to your, with your friends every week to a club and spend a hundred bucks on drinks and you feel terrible, well, you may be hungover, but you may also be feeling guilty about the money you spent because you didn't want to spend that money, but you felt forced to spend that money. hundred bucks a week is $5,000 a year in drinks. Does that make sense? I don't know. It may make sense to you. But again, if you don't know your values, you will never know it okay so if i haven't repeated myself enough times <laughs> let your values guide your choices know yourself when you know yourself it's easier for you to say yes to things it's easier for you to say no to things and you can live happily all right so any questions so far or any questions. I mean, that, that's, that's it. That's all I wanted to share with you today. I hope that was useful. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. I have a resource pages that I'm going to share with you. I'm going to send to um, 
Jasmine as well to share with, with everyone. Uh, but uh, any uh, questions? Thank you, Miguel. I wouldn't, I mean, I have tons of questions, but I don't want to take up too much time from anyone else. But I think, you know, chunking out your family visits like that was helpful. Um, I know that was part of the reason I left teaching. I thought about like how many hours I was spending thinking about teaching or like doing teaching related activities. And then I thought about my sleep schedule and I ended up with like three free hours of life. And I was like, oh no, this is crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it did take my therapist to tell me all of this timetable, but I was like, damn, no wonder I'm stressed. Um, but sometimes when you see like a number and you calculate it, then it makes you like actually make a better goal. Um, so I think that's really helpful. Like Miguel said, we are still here for a bit more. So if anyone does have questions, um, either related to goal making or any kind of preliminary financial kind of setting things, feel free to unmute yourself or chat it in. Um, he is a great resource. Um, I don't know if any of you attended the intergenerational wealth session he did last year. It was phenomenal. Um, so I feel like this is a great opportunity to just kind of get him while he's here. Clay, yeah, really, go ahead. Julian, if you hated this presentation, also let me know. <laughs> Don't worry. Clay, I think Clay has a question. What's up, Clay? Hey, um, thanks a lot. Um, always an honor to talk to you. Really, really appreciate your time. Um, Reflecting on goals, I am not sure if this is the goal I actually really care about or something people have kind of like put on me, which is the owning a, a home, uh, being a homeowner. I, I go back and forth whether it's something I actually want or whether it's kind of like back when I, people told me I should go to college and I just kind of did it. I don't know if I actually want it. It's kind of really hard. And when I do think about the realities of what it would take to get to buy a house and own a house, First, I don't really even have a clear like direction of, of like how many thousands of dollars that you save a year to put a down payment. And it's just very like overwhelming to think about that. Um, like, where, like where I live, the houses are ex extremely expensive. I'm, I I don't know if, if stuff like that is something you, you help with people on helping them get clarity, whether they even want that or not. Um, sure, what a, what a fantastic question, Clay. Uh, really? It is true that buying a house is very difficult. From what you're saying, some areas of the country are even more expensive than really ever. And really, it comes down to what is important to you. Really, that, that's what should drive your decision to buy that house and, or to even consider to start saving for that down payment. And at the end of the day, if you decide not to buy the house, you still have that money and you can use for whatever you want. And so let's say you decide, and that's, that's one thing about goals is that goals are not set in stone. Let's say for example, that you decide, okay, I'm gonna, you see a house and that house is worth a million bucks, even though it's just a two bedroom <laughs> with no back jars. Well, that's what some houses cost in some places. Well, let's say you want to save for whatever down payment you wanna take. That's, 30,000 at a minimum, now, let's say 40,000. Well, if at the end of the day, you get to see that money in your bank and you decide that not buying the house is better, you still have that money and you can do whatever you want with it. But if you're still thinking, if you start just thinking about, you're still thinking about what you may do and you end up doing nothing, you don't have the money. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so, even if it's a temporary goal of, you know, I'm gonna just set aside money, say if it's for the down payment, and you have enough money, turns out you don't wanna, turns out you don't really wanna buy a house, well, you still have that money and you can use it to do whatever you want. But if, if you feel that you are having paralysis by analysis, you're thinking so much about it, you don't do nothing, that can be more, costly in the long run. And I hope I answer your question. 
Let me know if I didn't. Uh, do you know how that? Do you let's just say I hypothetically tomorrow say I'm, my goal is to buy a house, and I unfortunately live in those places where a house is about a million dollars. I don't. Does that in? Does that mean I have to save twenty five percent or twenty percent of a million dollars? Those are the things that. Yeah. So I have to save like two hundred grand in the next few years. Is that pretty much the reality of buying a house? I mean, there, there's some hum, house buying programs that allow you to to buy a house with a little, with as little as three percent, three to six percent. So, if it's a million bucks, it would be sixty thousand. So, yes, if you don't qualify for those programs, yeah, it should be about twenty to twenty five percent plus closing costs and whatever. So, yeah, we're looking easily two hundred thousand. Now, that's an interesting position to be. Because how many years is it going to take you to to be in that place to to have to save two hundred fifty thousand? Well, what if in ten years you move out of where you are right now and you go to a place where you can buy a house cash for that money instead of financing? So life is unpredictable. We don't know where we're going to be in ten years from now. But having being able to save that money gives you more options further down the road than not saving it. That's a great point. This is Lauren. I just wanted to add that today um, I was uh, listening to some podcasts, uh, New York Times, also the Daily, and I heard somewhere that, yeah, you should expect to pay around two, 200K down payment uh, mm -hmm. right now or for the next few months. Another thing that I'm learning, though, um, I'm a really, really, really late bloomer, but we won't get into that. <laughs> but I'm trying to get up to speed. And another thing that I learned because I aggressively um, save money for my retirement. And um, you can also in the future, if you need to dip into that for home buying, that's also like some something. But another thing that I wanted to highlight, um, which I love, um, Miguel, that you mentioned that, you know, that money you're saving and it's going to be yours. And um, that may look different in the future. So I think that coming up here in the few in a few years, we're going to have a a few options for housing. Now, let me explain. With uh, remote work now, there's talk that um, real estate developers are going to actually build intentionally communities and in places where there aren't currently like uh, big metropolitan cities, but they will build them um, so that they're more accessible for people who want to live areas such as like where I live in San Francisco, where home buying is literally unaffordable for me. But yeah, I would just say don't feel don't feel disheartened, right? Because I'm on that same boat with everyone, but I just keep saving and thinking that maybe someday, you know, <laughs> they will meet me halfway somewhere and I can get into that real estate pool. Mm -hmm. There you go. Thank you, Lauren. Great point. Anything else? Any other questions? Any comments, complaints, jokes, anything you wanted to ask? Miguel, hello, this is Oscar. Hi, Oscar. Um, one, thank you for just the information and everything that you've been giving us these past few minutes of education. Um, I've noticed that, well, one, I, I found your podcast in the Spanish one and the Apple podcast, and that kind of amazed me. It's like, oh, I got to learn more about this and more about how you're teaching this to our communities. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's more targeted for us, the millennials, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think Clay mentioned that, that his parents or his generation was um, the pressure of going to school. And now after school, it's like, all right, buying a home. So will you be providing more of these workshops for specifically us younger younger generation so that way we could be more informative and then bring in awareness to our communities as well? Because I feel like the cycle of getting this information from a white financial uh, certified planner versus a Hispanic certified uh, planner is totally different. Um, so I don't know, like, will you guys be partnering up and doing more workshops of this? Um, or how is that going to work out? Yeah, so there's going to be a, a Goals 202 in July, which I go a little bit deeper in goal setting. So it's kind of the basics. So in a month, we're going to do a second part, which go a little bit deeper. Uh, uh, so yes, and there's, I'm pretty sure there's going to be more. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the podcast is, is geared towards, uh, it's in Spanish. So it's for really uh, people that are, comfortable listening to stuff in Spanish. And, and what I do in the podcast is very basic, uh, very general uh, for, for more people to understand these concepts. Uh, Lauren, the podcast is called Dinero en Español. I'm going to put it in the chat. 
And there's also in the resources at very top li very top link in my link tree slash Miguel Gomez, you'll find a link to my newsletter, to my podcast in some platforms and, and so on. Yeah, I want to, this is Omar Reynoso. I want to thank you for coming out here, Miguel. I think me as an older uh, guy who came in, I came into the investing later in life. Um, I, I came through the military uh, because I, I, I didn't see, for, it was harder back in, in the 90s uh, how to go straight into college uh, with my parents, you know, both work in the fields and whatnot. So uh, I, I think this is, this is a great uh beginner course for younger the younger generations latinx and everybody else because if i would have known this stuff when I, I was you know fresh out of out of you know fresh into the military or fresh into the workforce it would help me out a lot because i didn't start investing until i was in my 20s don't get me wrong it, i did um save enough money i have my own home i'm i'm recently retired out of the army so yes i did uh, do right but if i would have learned a few years earlier which is a lot of these younger generation right now, they're not doing this so much information to include that, um, to know how much you need to save. Like, you know, uh, Clay was saying, how well, I need to save 200,000 for a house or uh, Laura was saying about in San Francisco. You gotta look at it also as well is look at where you're living at. That's, you know, look at, look where you, where do you want? Uh, like, this is what we do in the military. We decide, hey, where do I wanna live when I retire? Um, What's the job I want to do there when I retire? What, is, what are the companies that, that are hiring that do what I want to do? And do they have the same culture that, uh, that fits my, my what I want to do? And those are like simple steps that we, we, we uh, I, 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 I teach that on my own to my uh, fellow uh, veterans and, and fa family that are transitioning as well. Great. Thank you, Omar. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is... Every everyone that I meet, uh, when I when I hear stuff like this, they always tell me, "I wish someone told me this earlier." So, thank you, thank you, thank you, Omar, for sharing your comments. Um, oh, thank you. Thank oh, you hola, guys. Miguel. Uh, I had one last question. Sorry. Uh, yeah, thank sure. you. Thank you for uh, hosting this and giving us information. Um, can you, so I'm investing and I feel like I'm just kind of doing it blind. Can you explain the difference between like the 401k versus uh, the Roth option and like what, what, I don't, like, I don't even know what I don't know. So <laughs> I, I hear you, man. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, 401k and Roth, they're essentially... So it's called 401k because that's the section in the Internal Revenue Code that describes these types of plans. Uh, they, they set the rules there, and etc. Uh, and there's two types of them. There's the Roth contributions and there's the normal 401k contributions. The difference is when you pay the taxes on it. So the, the traditional 401k or the standard 401k is essentially tax deferred, meaning that the money that you put in the account is before taxes. So they take it from your um, gross pay, goes straight into your 401k. They do not deduct uh, federal income tax. They do deduct Social Security and Medicare, but they do not deduct uh, federal income tax. Uh, as a result, you pay a little bit of tax uh, when you do those contributions, but when you take the money out of the account, regardless of when you take it out, you're gonna have to pay income tax. Now, if you take it before 59 and a half, you're going to pay a 10% penalty in addition to your income tax. And the Roth option, now, every contribution that your employer gives you, match, profit sharing, that goes to your pre-tax account. Uh, when, you have a, uh, when you put money into the Roth, money goes essentially after your net. After all taxes have been paid, then money goes into your Roth. Uh, and what that, what that does is that you already pay taxes today. That means that if you have the plan for at least five years, you won't pay taxes when you take it out. If you take it out before 15 and a half, you're going to have to pay 10% tax on the earnings. Uh, 
and income tax on the earnings. But if you do that before five years, so yeah, a good a strategy would be to open a Roth IRA now, even if you don't have any money in it, open it so let it mature for five years so that you can have access to those funds tax-free when eventually move there. But of course, this, these are retirement accounts intended for retirement. You want to keep them for as long as possible. And I hope that answers your question, Jose. Great. Yeah, muchas gracias. Con mucho gusto. Anybody else? Alguien más? Alguna pregunta, duda, comentario? Miguel, I'm going to build on Jose's question mm -hmm. because I think I also hate retirement stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that there's also the 401s or like 401Bs. I had those as teachers with like unions. Mm -hmm. You can transfer those though, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You okay. can transfer you, you can transfer your fraud to to your current employer uh, as, as a rollover. You can transfer it to an IRA under your name. Okay. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mine's just sitting there. Yep. It's been like four years. I don't know what okay. to do with it. I was like, I'll come back to you guys. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I met people that they forget that they have accounts. Yeah. And, and they start working with me and all of a sudden, you know, I think I have money somewhere. And it turns out there's 50,000 in an account they've completely forgot about. Oh, I so, would love that type of problem. Yeah, so... I don't think I did. <laughs> no, don't let that happen. I mean, in 20 years, you never know how, how returns could be. But uh, yeah, you want to consolidate everything to have it as simple as possible. So one or two accounts, that, that should be enough. Any other questions, any other comments? If there aren't any, I think I also want to extend a thank you. Um, and I forgot who asked if there would be another. There definitely is one for July. And then I will, I think in general, there's just so many financial questions. And I think to that point, I do love hearing like from a Latino or someone that's Latinx, like how I can break down my finances. Maybe it's just like that weird, like imposter syndrome of like having to explain that I don't know shit um, to a white person. That's just not comforting, but I think it's helpful. So we'll definitely see how we can continue kind of pushing some of this to more Thickadia members. Um, and just even based on the call, I would love to see how we can get a few more of our uh, women on the call, because I think this is still such a thing that so many women have trouble with, like even questioning finances. Um, so really want to break that down too. But thank you, Miguel. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and then I'll make sure that this recording goes on YouTube as well, if you missed the beginning. Um, and then I think I dropped the link in the chat for the intergenerational wealth one. Here it is again. Uh, and we'll see you in July. Yep. Jasmine, I'll send you the list, the list of resources so you can put it on the on the YouTube uh, video. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, people can have it uh, there as well. Brene Brown's voice just makes me feel like I need to get my life together. <laughs> um, but I do love her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, she's very good. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.